Welcome to lesson number two, topic 1.1, the purpose and nature of businesses. Now we're going to continue on from the last lesson. And before we carry on any further, I'd like you to get these six terms down in your little blue book. So if you don't have a blue book, hopefully you have your own dictionary uh, notebook somewhere. <coughs> Excuse me. As the as you read and write these down, um, I'm going to go through them quickly and spend a little bit more time on the ones I believe you need or you may need a bit of elaboration on. Number one, entrepreneur. This is someone who is willing to take risks involved in starting a new business. Now, the key thing here is the risk part. Now, everyone, anyone can become a manager, a business person, but to be a, a real entrepreneur, you have to take risks. Number two, entrepreneurship. This refers to the ability to be an entrepreneur, to take risks to develop a business idea. Number three, a social enterprise. This is a business that is set up to help society rather than just to make a profit. Now, of course, there's going to be an element of making money um, to then use towards helping uh, these causes that they might be working for. Number four, resources, the inputs that businesses uh, use to provide their goods and services is basically what they have, what the machines, materials, even people, what they need to make what they need to make and sell it or the services they need to provide to sell. Number five, enterprise, another word used for a business. It also refers to the skills of the people involved in the business who identify business opportunities and bring together resources to meet these opportunities. And lastly, number six, interest. This is the money paid by the banks as a reward to attract people to save uh, with them. The easiest way to see interest is this, boys and girls. If you took money from someone, uh, let's just say it was a thousand pounds. Now, if you're borrowing money, then it's a safe bet to say it's because you don't have the money in the first place. That's why you're borrowing it. And in most cases, people take time to give that money back because it's usually a large amount. So if it's a thousand pounds that you're borrowing from someone, um, and let's just say you promise to give it back within 12 months, that person that you're borrowing from is going to ask themselves, okay, fine, I'm going to be out of a thousand pounds for a year. What do I get out, get out of it? Now, in the ideal world, it'd be lovely to be in a situation where people are helping because they want to help. But unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. So what people want is a reward. And that reward is interest. So you can get interest and you can give interest. Now, in this definition here, it's the money paid by the banks as a reward. So if you save money in your bank account, that means in, in essence, they're holding your money. So since it's them holding your money, the longer you hold it, the more reward they give you, i.e. interest. And that's usually uh, worked out as a percentage. Similarly, and I know it's not in this definition, but you're going to learn this anyway, so you may as well talk about this as well on the topic. Um, if you would take the money from them, then they are going to want a reward, i.e. interest, uh, for them giving you the money. Okay, so it goes both ways. If you need any time, uh, any longer to copy these down, please pause the video here. Otherwise, we're going to continue. Right, so we're going to go straight into another Business Insight case study. So please copy the subtitle down, Business Insight, and then in brackets, Richard Branson. Underline both items as well. So let's have a little read through of this case study. So Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin, set up his first business, a magazine called Student, in, 19, in the 1960s when he was at school. He used to run it from his school phone box. Since then, he has gone on to create hundreds of business under businesses under the Virgin name involving music, nightclubs, trains, planes, taxis, bridal wear, cola, insurance and pensions, and the list goes on. So what's the question? Well, we want you to analyse the characteristics that might explain Branson's success. So, remember in the last lesson, we talked about those four characteristics. Look back at your notes and ask yourselves, which two or three do you think he has? Explain it, use examples, and um, talk about how that has worked towards his, ex his success. Pause the video here, give yourself about eight minutes to, uh, to uh, do this task, and when you're ready, ready we can continue. So, Pause for a second, I'll be right with you. Okay, so hopefully you've paused it, you've given yourself some time, we're gonna move on. Here are the model answers. Now remember, these aren't the only answers, but these are some of the main ones you could and should include. Using the green pen, 
Think about how close you were to, uh, to considering these, uh, these answers. Give yourself a tick if you got it right. If you haven't, put it down. Um, add to it as you see fit. So let's look at the first one. Richard Branson could be considered to be innovative. There's your first mark for identifying one of the key characteristics. So how is this? And how was he innovative? So this can be a, this can apply to the way a business is run, a process as well as its products. For example, he ran an early business from the phone box near his school. So he has done new companies. He's gone from uh, having a newspaper magazine to you know having music yeah virgin records to having nightclubs and trains and planes and taxis bridalware and drinks and so on and so forth so every single time he's brought in something new and obviously each time you have a new type of product the way you run it will be different so for example you know because a music the music company he has virgin records is going to be run slightly differently from the Virgin Coke that he has because they're two different products. You know, the manufacturing alone for both of those items will be completely different. So the processes will be different. So therefore he will have to come up with new methods. And if it's new, he's been innovative. The second point, so you've got three points there, three marks there. The second point that you could have brought in is the fact that he has established many businesses, as I just mentioned, including the fact that he's got music and air travel and pensions. So this shows that he ha is hard working. So you can use the same points, but talk about different characteristics. So before we talk about innovative and talk about the processes and the fact that he has to do different things, new things, but at the same time, you can say because of how different these things are, he's got many different aspects to work on, many different branches, the company's expanding, therefore he has to be working harder and therefore he has to be determined because success isn't something that you get overnight. He will have had things that he made mistakes on, he will have made uh, seen pitfalls and so on and so forth, he would have had, uh, he would have made many failures along the years. So he would have had to be hard work and determined. Many of these businesses were set up after he had become a wealthy and successful businessman. Okay, so you've got two points there, six marks. If you've got something close to that, fantastic, well done. Otherwise, get this down. Let me just highlight again, boys and girls, that you get the mark for identifying the characteristics, so there's two marks there. Then the additional four marks is from the analyzing that, 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 you know, how you bring that in using an example. Now in our school, we have the peel chain. When you make the point, you use an example, you explain and then link to the next one. That's very, very important. Whenever you have any question that's more than two marks, I would always suggest that you use the peel chain, okay? I'll let you pause the video here if you need to copy uh, it down, if you haven't had enough time to do so. Otherwise, we're gonna move on now. Okay, we're gonna go back to the book. Um, which we, if you don't know which book I'm talking about, we're talking about the AQA GCSE 91 Business Second Edition book um, by Hodder Education. If you don't have a copy, please do go and get one. It's very, very, very um, important because it has everything you need um, to pass and, and succeed in this course. And we're going to go to page five. And we're going to start looking at types of businesses and their basic functions. So please copy this down as a subtitle. And underneath each one, I want you to talk, start talking about these sectors. So what sectors do businesses operate in? Now, let's talk about the three sectors first. And then we'll talk about how they work. Because the, 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 the thing that you need to consider is that even though we're, we're breaking it down to three sectors, some companies belong to only one, but other companies can belong to two out of the three. And in fact, there might be some companies that are so big, uh, they belong to all three. So let's look at the first one, primary sector. The primary sector, boys and girls, is anything to do with the first stage of um, the product itself. So you're either growing this item or you're um, fishing for this item, or you're digging for this item. So you are dealing with the raw materials. So it's the first stage, hence the word primary, like primary school, primary colours. So it's the first stage. Um, th these could uh, include, you know, examples include uh, farms, oil exploration companies, fishing fleets, um, and the list goes on, even diamond uh, um, and coal miners. So primary sector, you're just going to dig for it, fish for it, or you're farming it. You're not doing anything else to it yet. But the moment you do something to it, so you're turning that raw material, let's just say a, a potato. So this is an example I often use in my lessons. 
if you're a farmer who gets the potato, you grow it, and you get it out of the ground, you clean it, and you send it to someone, you're in the primary sector. But then you might be a company that works with the potato. So you're now in the second stage, you're basically cutting it up. So let's use walkers as an example. They then get the potato and then turn it into crisps, package it up and then send it out for selling. So the moment you do something to a raw material, the products from the, uh, from the primary sector companies, so you're manufacturing or you're changing it, you're in the second stage, therefore the secondary sector. So, so far that should make sense. The first stage, the second stage, or primary and secondary. The third stage is when you come to just selling it. So if you don't do anything with the product, i.e. you don't grow it, you don't make, and you don't make it, all you do is buy and sell, then all you're in the third stage. That's the tertiary sector. So walkers, keep into the same example, walkers don't have a walker shop. Well, I've never seen one anyway. If you want to buy a, pa a packet of walkers, you go to your local news agent, grocery store, Asda, Tesco, something like that, Morrison, Sainsbury's. So what will happen is that walkers will sell all their items, their crisps in bulk to these big companies. And these companies then get a cut from their sales when they sell it in the stores. So there you go. Primary sector, you get the potato, you grow it. The moment you make something out of it, you're in the second receptor because you're doing something to it. The moment you're ready to sell, you're in the third stage, therefore you're in the tertiary sector. Now, at the moment, I've given you an example where you actually have that separation. The farmer is not owned by market walkers, so therefore that's a, the farmer is in the prime sector separate. The walkers company then goes buys buy, goes to purchase these uh, quality potatoes from these, these farmers, so they are in the secondary sector, they are separate from the farm. And then walkers then sell it onto other companies, i.e. Asda, to sell it onto the normal consumers, the pub, general public, people like you and me. And therefore, they're in the tertiary sector because they don't own walkers and they don't make those crisps. But then you could have companies that own, belong to two or three of these. Sticking to Asda, they might own their own uh, or work with local farmers. And therefore, they might be in the primary sector. So, for example, the milk that they sell. They have their own branded milk. So they might be working in t membership or partnership with uh, local farmers in, in Britain somewhere. And therefore, they have that that that, that uh, ownership of that farm. Maybe the sponsor, who knows? So maybe they actually own it. And therefore, as they could be in the private sector, they take that milk into their own factories. They filter it. They clean it. They, they package it up. You know, they have to make that... The, the, the bottle, they have to make the label to put it all in one place and then they have to deliver it to the stores. So that means they're making something out of that milk into a product that's viable, that's actually sellable. Therefore, they're in the secondary sector. And they're, of course, they're in the tertiary sector. So you can have companies who belong to all three. So keep that in mind. Hopefully you made some notes on this. If not, pause the video. Look at the top of page six. You have a bit more information there. Otherwise, let's continue on to the next task. Now, we're going to move on to some maths here. Now, other past GCSE business courses didn't have that much of an emphasis on maths and numbers and accountancy or anything like that. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you know, optimistic and how much you love maths, um, we do have an element of maths and accounting in this new course. So every so often, we're going to be having some um, tasks that are centered and around centered around um, uh, the use of maths in business so let's look at this this is in the middle of page six um, and let's read for this so about two percent of workers in the UK are employed in the primary sector so keeping to the sectors that we just talked about about 22 percent are employed in the secondary sector so what I want you to do is before you start the questions I want you to copy the subtitle maths moment and underline it and then I want to put the number one and number two and try and attempt these questions. Now, I will give you the answers in the next slide, uh, but let's understand the question and let's give it a go first. What percentage of employees are employed in the tertiary sector? So using the numbers that you have there, I want you to use that. By the way, guys, we want to see working out. So you have to show the calculation as well as the answer. So what percentage would you assume are tertiary? Number two, what are the biggest businesses in your area? Are they primary, secondary, or tertiary? Now, I'm going to give you a few minutes here. Pause the video, and um, I'll see you in a few seconds. Okay, hopefully you've had a moment to give that a go. Let's have a look at the model answers. 
So assuming that the employees are classified as being in just the three sectors, because there are other sectors, believe it or not, but we're not going to go into that because we don't need to know that for the exam. Primary sector, secondary sector and the tertiary sector, then 76% of people in the UK are employed in the, in the tertiary sector. Um, so 100 minus 2 plus 22. So if we go back for a second, actually, yeah, go back for a second. You see we have 22% in the tertiary sector and 2% in the prime sector. So you basically put the 22 and the 2 together, 24, minus it from 100. Easy. Okay, so. And that gives 76%. So what you should take away from that, boys and girls, is that this country has moved away from, a huge portion of the country has moved away from growing things and making things to selling things. A lot of us are now working in office-based jobs where we're selling something, insurance, uh, phones, cars, whatever it is, it's more on the sales and tertiary side, a service, whether you're a doctor or something like that. Even if you're on your feet, you're still providing service. Number two, what are the biggest business businesses in your area are the primary, secondary and tertiary. Now, this is a hard one because it's all dependent on where you are. But what you'll notice is what I've just highlighted, that the vast majority of the companies that are around your area will fall on the tertiary sector because that is the major, the most popular type of job there is nowadays. That's not to say that people won't be in the secondary and primary. There will be a, there'll be a smaller group or a small percentage on those two. Okay, so if you need to copy any of these down, um, pause the video. Otherwise, let's continue on to the next next section. We're now going to look at the bottom half of page six and going to go into page eight. Please uh, copy the subtitles, the functions of a business, and let's talk about this. So, a business transforms into outputs. To be successful, it must understand its customers effectively and make sure it provides products that are in demand. It needs to think about the nature of the product, how to promote the benefits of the product and to, to potential customers, and what, the price, and what to price to set and how and where customers will want to buy it. These activities are all part of the marketing function, which we're going to look at in Chapter 5. Um, the business must produce the goods or service. For example, running a hotel involves activities such as taking bookings, cleaning rooms, managing the restaurant, and so on and so forth. The activities involved in the production of the products are parts of the operation function. Again, we're going to look at this in a, in a later chapter, chapter 3, um, and we'll be making some videos around that as well. To provide a product, product will will involve people. In many cases, there are there there may only be one person in the business, but some organisations will have hundreds and or thousands of people working for them. Managing people, for example, recruit uh, recruiting and training and deciding how to reward them, is known as the human resource function, which is going to be in chapter four. A business will also have to manage money. It will need to raise finance. It will need to monitor what is spent in different parts of the business. They'll need to calculate whether the business has enough money. These activities are part of the finance function, and that's from chapter six. Whether the business is small or large, and whatever products it provides, it will have marketing, finance, human resources, and operation uh, operations functions. So to put simply, boys and girls, when we say the functions of a business, functions is the different parts, or another word to say it uses the different departments each department of a business will will be responsible or in charge of different things so the different departments or functions we're talking about or we have to use in the exam is marketing which is all about the advertising and and, and market research understanding the products and the customers operations which is the making of and selling of products human resources which is about the people how you deal with them how you bring them in how to get rid of them, yeah, so in some cases, how you train them, reward them, pay them, and the finances, which is linked to pay, but it's all about the budgeting. Where is the money coming from? Where is the money going? How much are we making? Can we afford this? Can we afford that? What's the budget like? Those kind of things. Moving on, the dynamic nature of business. Now, this is a big one. I'm not going to go into too much detail. The information is on page 7 and goes on to page 8. What you need to understand here is... Um, the kinds of things that can affect business, the business. And this is the things, in most cases, that are outside of the business because business is control. So business will be affected by changes in a business environment. This refers to all the factors outside of the business that can affect it, the things that are not inside the, the, the company that we might be referring to. Now, we have a number of things here in front of you. 
techn technological change, economic change, legal change, environmental change. And these are changes that might happen in those categories that businesses shouldn't ignore, that might shape the business and what they sell and how they sell it. So for example, uh, technology is an easy one. Just look at um, phones uh, over just in the last five to 10 years, how much they've changed. I mean, right now, um, we're looking at phones that are uh, fighting to get as much as much um, publicity as they can and profile for having the larger screen um, and a screen to body ratio. For years, people have been fighting over how powerful, how, how um, specked out the the camera sensor is or how much memory it has or how much RAM it has. But nowadays, at the moment, right now, people are fighting about the screen and how they implement the fingerprint sensor as a result because people are putting them on the back or in, you know, behind the screen. Uh, what's happening with the, the front-facing camera? So a lot of companies have adopted the notch style. But there are phone companies out there like Samsung who have got big, big um, ideas and hopefully innovation where they'll have different variations of the notch, uh, different from what's happening right now, the ugly design, but what in my opinion is the ugly design of having that big notch at the top, the big forehead, um, and have this, the actual camera on the inside behind the screen so you don't see it. Um, but there are some phones at the moment that have the slide technology where the screen is a full screen but you slide something up or you press a button and there's a mechanism that pushes the camera up instead. So these technological changes are pushing other companies to think outside the box and come up with different designs uh, which they probably wouldn't have thought about uh, because they wouldn't have had to. Um, it's because of competition that's pushing people to think okay what can we do as a result so what can we do that's going to be better than our competition to you know to attract the attention of their customers and our, keep our customers. Economic change um, involves a range of economic factors outside of the business, such as the cost of borrowing money from banks, so interest rates, the rate of which, at which prices are increasing, which is called inflation, and the income in the, uh, in the economy, which is known as gross domestic, gross, gross domestic, I can't get my words out, sorry, gross domestic product, or also known as GDP. Some of these words might be familiar if you take geography, otherwise, don't worry, we are going to have separate uh, videos and lessons around these to explain further. We have talked about interest rates already in a previous in the, the video before this, which is basically the, the reward for saving or uh, saving money. So the reward the bank gives you for keeping your money with them, or the reward the money you give, uh, the reward that you give them for taking their money and keeping it. So it's that additional money for either borrowing or saving. Inflation is basically how prices change over time. So I'm gonna make myself sound uh, at, the, at the risk of making myself sound really old here, but. There was a time when I was in high school, a, a bus ticket to town was about 30p, 34p. The same bus journey, so the journey itself hasn't gone longer or you know the distance hasn't increased and at the end of the day, bus, a bus is a bus. But the same bus journey is about £1.52 now. So what's happened? Prices have gone up and that's inflation. And I think the easiest way to remember inflation is basically, imagine a price is a balloon. And the more you blow into it, the bigger the balloon gets. You're inflating the balloon. So the bigger the balloon gets, the, incre the, the, the higher the price is getting. So inflation is not necessarily a good thing because it means people, customers, are having to pay more over the years. Which means unless people are getting more, paid more for work, they actually could be making less money, if that makes sense. Yeah? To put simply, guys, imagine if you're making 10 grand a year, this year, hundred pounds a month, you know, a, you know, a trolley full of stuff will not be the same trolley the next year because if the prices are going up, it means that same trolley will look smaller next year. There might be some items you just won't be able to afford because your hundred pounds isn't stretching as far because you're not going to be able to get as much because, like I said, other items have become more expensive. All of a sudden, it's not 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 enough. The same items could actually be you know, 110 pounds, 120 pounds. So if you're not being paid more at work and your 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 salary isn't in line with inflation, you could actually be making less money every year. So these are the things that you have to think, you know, consider as well. Gross domestic product is basically, to put simply, a measure of how wealthy a country is. And it's all down to how much money is circulating, how much money people are making. And it's a good measure to see how wealthy a country is, like I said.
Legal change. Now, these are new laws, regulations, legislations. These are the things that might affect the cost of a business, but you can't ignore them because obviously if you do, it's a law. If, you're breaking the, if you ignore the law, you're breaking the law. But perfect example, a few years ago, uh, the 5p charge for carry bags was introduced. It was a law that every company that has, I believe it was a, more than 100 staff. If you have more than 100 staff, you have to charge 5p to your customers uh, for, char uh, for for having a carry bag. Now, the government decided to do that. Uh, the reason behind that was obviously to reduce um, pollution, you know, plastic bag, bag waste and, and so on and so forth. So the, the intention was is, is a good one. But as you can understand, a lot of companies were, were worried that this increase in price, even though it's a 5p charge, a lot of company or customers that would go in, not knowing you know that it was a law and the reason behind it, would get annoyed and remember, your reputation as a company is, is gold, basically. Because if your reputation goes down, you're losing customers. You need to keep your reputation positive for you to have repeat customers of repeat sales. So a lot of companies will have been, understandably so, worried about, upsetting customers um, but it's something they had to do so they a lot of companies like Tesco for example as they preempted this months before it came into practice uh, they basically had a big campaign they're giving away the bags for life uh, for free they had posters they were letting people know listen this is what this is what's happening this is when it's happening so they kept customers in loops so that when it did take uh, um, effect it wasn't that much of a sting for the customers uh, and it would, therefore it didn't impact their reputation that much. But it was a change by the law that they couldn't ignore. Uh, recently, there was a change in um, costs for a tax on sugar. So the more sugar you use for your ingredients, the more com the government is going to charge you. So if you're making something that has a lot of sugar in it, it means you're going to have to pay more to the, to the government for making that. So you have two options. Either your money goes down, as in your profit, because you're all of a sudden, you know, the same item is going to... Um, cost you more to make it now even though it's the same item the production is the same but you know one ingredient has gone up so let's just say you're a cake shop and you know you need sugar to make your cakes all of a sudden that same cake you've been making for months or years um isn't making the same amount of profit not because the sales are going down but because it's costing you more to make it in the first place but if you don't follow the rule you're going to be charged yeah, so these are the legal changes that you have to consider. Environmental expectations. The customers and consumers are increasingly interested in the impact of a business on the environment. What resources it, uh, it is using. How it, uh, is it producing the products? How does it transport its, its products? The impact of the actions of a business can influence whether a customer uses that business or not. Even, even if demand was not affected, some business people would still be concerned about the environmental impact because it affects what the world will be like for future generations. See topic 2.2 for more about environmental consider, uh, considerations. So we're gonna have a separate video on lesson or lessons on that. To put simply boys and girls, the world has changed. Customers actually now think about the optics and how ethical, how companies look. Are they doing the right thing? Are they just about money? Do they seem cold or do they show at least, or do they at least look like they care about the people that work for them, the environment that they work uh, around, the local place that they are, the locality, the factories, you know, are they polluting their local rivers, lakes and, and the sky, whatever it is, it's about those things there. So the changes in the environment environment is what the interests and the opinions of the, uh, or the public opinions, how they've changed. You know, you could say um, global warming as an example. You know, people worry and actually are genuinely interested in global warming and how companies have an effect on that. So those these four things, very, very important. These are changes basically that are, again, just to summarize, these are the changes that are that take place outside of a company, but the company shouldn't ignore. And it affects the way the company runs. Right, three more words. I'm going to copy these words down in your dictionary, your small little books, your blue books if you're on my lesson. Um, interest rates refer to the cost of borrowing money of the or the reward of saving for saving money expressed as a percentage. Inflation refers to the rate at which prices are increasing. For example, if inflation is 2%, prices are generally growing by 2% uh, that year. I've discussed these already, so I'm not going to go into that much detail. Gross domestic product GDP measures all the income and uh, income earned in a country's e economy in, that in a year. 
So get these down into your books. Uh, we will be making reference to these uh, in the future, in um, future topics. Um, if you need more time, please hit pause the video. Otherwise, we're going to move on. This brings us to the end of this lesson. What I'd like you to do, as always, I want you to write five things uh, that you've learned without looking, um, five things that you've learned from this session, five things that you found interesting uh, from this lesson, and uh, put it down in your books. If you're in my lesson, of course, I'll be checking these and reading them. I'll be interested to see how much you've gathered from this, and try to be honest, please, ladies and gents. If you're at home, just use it as a, an opportunity um, just to test yourself, really. So write five things without looking, give me five things, and go back and see whether what you've written is accurate to your notes. And of course, if you've got this uh, book, then you can you make reference with, to that as well.